It was March or so of 1985, and my uncle took me to a monster truck show on the coast. Most, most of you guys have heard this story before. And uh, on the way, he got to uh, talking about uh, church and, and Jesus with me. Actually, I broached the subject, if I remember right, because I, I, I had run across a uh, verse of Scripture, Psalms 23.4, in, uh, in a Reader's Digest, and, it, and I memorized it, and I wanted to tell my uncle that I, I knew a verse of Scripture. Well, that opened up the subject, and he got to, to, to witness it to me all night on the way home from uh, from that monster truck show. Uh, he, he he pinned me up on it. He said, you know, he told me about salvation and, and the sins penalty and and how to be saved. He said he said you want to he said if you want to get saved, we'll stop this truck right here on the side of the road. We'll we'll take care of it. Well, I didn't want to do it yet. So for the next year, I kind of dodged and ran and uh, and. and I went to church because I, I I was 14 years old and dad would let me drive to church. So I, so I drove to, to a church over in Lee Town, heard the gospel many Sundays during the year, not every Sunday by a little shot, but I, but I knew, I knew where I was at and knew what I, what I needed to do. And so Easter Sunday morning, that was March 26, 1986, um, no, I'm sorry, 1989. So it started in 1988. So March 26, 1989, uh, Easter Sunday morning, um, Dad was on the road driving the truck. And I got up and, and, uh, and said, Mom, let's go to church. And we, we ended up at Antioch Baptist Church over on East Canal Street. And I uh, don't remember what the preacher preached on. It was probably something about resurrection, being as how it was Easter, because I was there for one reason. I knew when the invitation time come that I was going to go forward and get saved. And uh, I'll never forget, I remember when when he gave the invitation and said, come on, I don't think I could have stayed in that pew if I wanted to. You know, once I took a step, it felt like felt like something was pulling me. And, and, and so I went forward, and, and then Brother Henry Phelps led me. He, he showed me the Roman road, you know, but I already, I already pretty much knew, and he led me in the prayer, and I, I got saved that morning. So that is that is my testimony. All right. And if you are saved as well, then you too have a, a testimony. Your testimony is, is just basically uh, the, the story of how you came to Christ, how you realized you were lost, what the process was, and how you came to Christ. You know, uh, some people feel like uh, they don't have a very exciting testimony. You know, because there are some people out there, and they've got they've got a testimony of just how uh, <laughs> absolutely deplorable they were in the bad condition they were in before they got saved. Then after saved, got, and, you know, God worked them in a, a miraculous work in their life, and everything uh, was better, and they were bound for heaven and forgiven, and, and that's great. All right, uh, but really, every testimony is miraculous because you were dead in sin and trespasses, eternally damned. And God resurrected you, literally gave you life, gave you the righteousness as his, as his son, Jesus. So every testimony is, is miraculous and encouraging and interesting and should be used in personal evangelism. It is our greatest tool in telling other people about Jesus Christ is telling our story about what happened to us. And the reason I shared that was because we're going to be talking tonight about the importance of personal baptism. This is probably going to wrap up the basic series that we've been in. I can't guarantee that. But uh, but personal evangelism is what we're going to talk about tonight. And I, I, gotta, um, I gotta tell you, I'm doing things a little bit differently this evening. Usually I have a manuscript running on my computer. Tonight I just have handwritten talking points. Okay, I did that for two reasons. Number one, you, I, don't, I don't think I should probably need a manuscript to talk about evangelism. And number two, when we put uh, what we're going to talk about tonight into practice, uh, it can't be scripted. It's going to be a little different every time. So we better be ready to, uh, to, to uh, pivot 
a little bit and to know what we're talking about, all right? But we don't have to be perfect. We'll talk about all that in just a minute. So first of all, let's just, let me get my glasses on here so I can see. Um, we're going to talk about personal, let's talk about what is evangelism. Here's a uh, definition from Oxford. Evangelism, the spreading of the Christian gospel by public preaching or personal witness. All right. And I like that, that definition there, uh, public preaching or personal witness. Um, it, it's in our, our description of our, uh, not our, our denomination of Baptist, not an official terminology, but, but what do we call uh, the, the genre of Christianity that, that Baptist is part of? We are evangelical evangelical because we believe in the importance of public preaching and personal witness i was thinking as i was putting that together i don't know what non-evangelical churches do <laughs> you know do they just do they just hide it or what? i mean i i don't know that's a different subject for another day maybe somebody can explain that to me at some point all right so uh if we believe then that our church should be evangelical then we have to ask the question, whose responsibility is it to evangelize? I'm asking you. Member of the congregation. Yeah. All right. Key point that I want to make is it's not just your pastor. All right. And I'm not saying this just to you guys because I know you are evangelists, but I'm saying this. I'm making a video for everybody, and I don't know who your pastor might be, uh, whoever's watching this, but it's not just your pastor's job to be the evangelist in your church. All right. It is everybody's responsibility. In fact, I would say that a pastor has no more greater responsibility to evangelize than any other Christian. All right. But a pastor does have the extra responsibility of equipping the folks in his congregation to be able to do that, right? So it's everybody's responsibility to evangelize, to share our faith, to witness, if you will, to use some of the other terms that we use, all right? So we're going to talk tonight about um, the biblical support for personal evangelization, uh, evangelism. I almost said evangelism. I almost made up a new word. Some methods of personal evangelism and some of the details that tie it all together. All right, so let's start with this. From the scriptures, why should we share our faith? Is there biblical evidence that says that we should all share our faith? And I say, we don't have to go any further to start with than our great commission. And uh, this is from, of course, Matthew chapter 28. Uh, what is that, 19 and 20? I forgot to fill it all in. But the words of Jesus Christ, he said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now, we know that Jesus said that to the apostles who were going to be starting the church. So it wasn't just to them. It was something that is applicable to every one of us as the church as a whole to uh, to be evangelists, all right? Excuse me. Speaking of Jesus, we're supposed to be like him, right? We're supposed to emulate him. We're supposed to do the things that Christ did. And what did Jesus do for the, the, the time that he spent here on earth? He, he spread the, his own gospel. He evangelized. He, he told about him. Think about the greats of the New Testament. Uh, you know, first comes to mind is, is Paul and, and Peter. You know, and we know how Paul went from, from city to city starting churches and he would go to synagogues, he would go to the public places, wherever somebody would listen to him and, and preach the gospel and share it to him publicly. Uh, Peter, the same way. Uh, we see that right in the beginning of the book of Acts, right after Pentecost. Peter's out in the, in the square preaching the word, all right? Um, so they were apostles, but is it is it just the apostles and the leaders that were to evangelize? No, we've got other uh, examples. Uh, think about Philip, who, uh, who God used to witness to the Ethiopian. Uh, Philip wasn't an apostle. He, he was a church member. Uh, Stephen, who got stoned for his witness. He was, he was not a, an apostle. 
right? So we know that there's plenty of biblical examples, uh, in New Testament examples, even the Old Testament. Let me show you an Old Testament verse that tells us to witness. From Psalms chapter 96, sing unto the Lord, bless his name, show forth his salvation from day to day. <laughs> That's from before Jesus even walked the earth. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonder among all people. And uh, just a disclaimer, if you happen to be watching this and you don't know Christ as your Savior yet, don't be offended that we just called you a heathen. It's just, it's a, in the Old Testament way of thinking, that would have been somebody who's non-Jewish because they weren't God's people, right? And in our thinking, that means somebody who's not a Christian yet, right? So you're just lost, right? In sin. But we're not against you. All right, so let's go on. Beyond the biblical mandate, so we, we've established there that, that, yes, the Bible tells us to evangelize, to witness, share our faith, but, but even beyond that, if, if somehow Scripture did not tell us to specifically tell others, why would we still do it? I might give you a, a reason. Why, why would we do it if, if there was no mandate to do it? F-O-V-E. Love. Yes. Love. We, we have something that literally saves our life for eternity. How could we not share that? If we say we, we love, and that's our commandment, right? Love our neighbor as ourselves. How could we ever say that we love people and, and keep our faith to ourselves? To keep, it, is, it changes everything. We go from death to life that never, ever ends. All right. So let's talk about some of the methods of evangelizing. Now, from the way I'm going to present this is from what I see to be, for me, the least to the most effective in the, the three methods that I'll, uh, that I'll talk about tonight. Now, there's some caveats to that. Caveats are number one, not everybody is the same, all right? Because we have different personalities and we have different gifts that are given by the Holy Spirit, all right? So, so what works for for me in witnessing may you may have a different gift and a different method that works best for you. So I'm just telling you what goes what seems to be the most effective for me. And also speaking of everyone not being the same. The people that we witness to in the world uh, are different. And some will react better to different methods than, than others will. So we have to always be ready to feel that out, right? All right. So I told you I'm going to give you three methods. Here's another caveat. Everyone should utilize all three of the methods that we discussed tonight. All three. Now, we, we can't pick our favorite one and say, I'm just going to witness this way and I'm going to disregard the others. Everybody should use all three of the methods that we discussed. All right. Caveat number three, leadership of the Holy Spirit should determine the method situationally. All right. That means who we witness to, at what time, what manner of which we do it. Uh, the Holy Spirit covers all of that. Not our preference of the way that we would like to do it because that might not always work and i believe if we if we're sensitive and we listen to the holy spirit and his guidance then he'll help us to see what's the best way at the best time to witness to somebody right? uh, feel free you guys to uh, to throw something in at any point there uh, if you got a, a point to add um number four you are not going to save anyone now, that sounds like a strange thing to say, doesn't it? You're not going to save anyone. What are we doing here? Remember what Paul said. I planted, Paul is watered, but God gave the increase. We can't save people. Right? So go ahead and let go of that pressure that you have to get this perfect. You know, because I think that's what makes people nervous about witnessing a lot of times. That I'm going to make a mistake. I'm going to say something I'm going to leave out a part or I'm going to say something wrong. Look, you're not the one saving people. You're just playing a part. Now, the more you do it, the better you get at it. Like anything, when we practice it, we get better at it. All right? 
And, and look, you know how to get saved if you are saved because you did it. And so you know how to tell somebody else. You might not feel real confident about it, but you know, right? So here's another point on that. Chances are, if the Holy Spirit instructs you to witness to someone, he's already dealing with that person too, right? I would, and, and probably in every situation he is, I, I, but I, I, I hesitate to say that just a little bit because I got to thinking about it, you know, everybody who's heard about Jesus Christ heard about him at some point for the very first time in their life, you know? And, and so just a thought that comes to my mind is what if the Holy Spirit tells me to witness to somebody and they've never heard it before, you know? And, and then you get the privilege of being the first person to ever mention Jesus Christ to somebody. And I say that as, as a privilege because that is, a, that's a great privilege, all right? So, uh, and, and then you've planted and then maybe somebody else will come along and water and, and God will give that increase. All right, so with those caveats, let's talk about the uh, the methods, right? Number one, lowest on my list is called lifestyle evangelism. Lifestyle evangelism seems to be everybody's favorite. Right? It's the easiest, it's the least frightening, and kind of technically it's the foundation for all of the others, all right? Also, it's the least directly effective, though. We'll talk about what, what is lifestyle evangelism. Basically, that means living like a Christian before other people so that they will see something that's different about you and then ask you about it. That's the hope in lifestyle evangelism. I'm gonna, I'm gonna live, they'll notice, and then they'll come to me and say, what is different about you? And I'm not saying that never happens, it might. It just might. Uh, and I'm not saying that that's wrong by any means. You, we should do that. We should be living like Christ before the world anyway are, are living like a Christian. I think if we're not saying anything or not doing the other parts, we're not living exactly like Christ, but we should be living a good, clean example in front of people and they should notice. They should look at a Christian person and say something is different about that person and be curious about what it is, all right? But that can't be all. That can't be all that we do. If we do that, we're falling short because number one, most people won't ask. You know, they'll they'll see it and maybe they know we go to church or something like that, but most people aren't gonna come out and say, mm, tell me about what makes you different. I say it don't happen, but it, it's not very common. And they cannot learn enough to be saved just by watching us. You know, we that may break the ice, it may get their attention, but but who's ever watched you close enough to, to figure out what they need, what they're missing, how to get saved just by, by watching? It doesn't work like that. All right, we have to put words to our walk. All right, so the pros of the lifestyle evangelism is it's the least stressful. The con is, is not enough by itself. All right, method number two, I call it impromptu witnessing impromptu witnessing. Now, some people are obviously just gifted by God for this. Now, how many people, you probably all know somebody that can walk into a restaurant full of strangers and just witness to people like it's just flowing like water out of them because they're just, God has just given them ability to do that. And, uh, and that is awesome. That is great. Uh, most of us though, we have to make ourselves do this, don't we? It, it requires some effort on our part, some, some forethought and some, some stepping out of our comfort zone. So some examples of, uh, of impromptu witnessing are uh, street preaching. Now let's be honest, most of us are not gonna do street preaching, right? Where we stand on the street corner and, and proclaim the word. And nothing wrong with it, absolutely not. But most of us just aren't gonna do that. Uh, and uh, another example of that is, is door to door ministry going door to door through the neighborhood. Um, I, in today's day and age, now some people there again, I've known some people who were uh, just had a gift of going to people's door and being able to talk to them. But for the most part, I don't think that's very effective in, in this day and age because in, in our society today, people don't want you to come to their door. 
you know, they're automatically closed minded when you get there. I'm not saying it's never effective. I'm just saying it's not always effective. Uh, another method that's, uh, that, that some people use very effectively is the handing out of tracks giving out tracks, right? That's a good thing to do, but here's something we gotta be careful about that even today. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. A while back, I got, I got to set it up to go back. So I was at Walmart in town several, several months ago back. And there was a uh, there was a nice older gentleman, I noticed him in the parking lot, and he had some gospel tracks that looked like $100 bills on the outside, y'all ever seen those? And he was handing them out to people, and, uh, and I actually seen him, it opened that he was having a conversation with somebody about one of them, you know? And uh, and I thought, man, that's, that's nice. And he's out here, you know, passing out these tracks and stuff, and that's good. And it was, and I'm sure it was, you know, he was doing a fine job. So I go on, and uh, sometime later, Within a few weeks, uh, on one of the, the local Picayune Facebook pages, a young lady, I don't know her at all, didn't recognize the name, but she has a big post on there about how some man at Walmart, uh, oh, I forgot to tell you, there was a thing going around on social media for a while about how uh, drug people would lace $100 bills with fentanyl and stick them under people's windshield wipers. Which is something that I think probably doesn't really happen, but I guess the premise was you'd reach it again, get the money, and then pass out, and they rob you or whatever. And well, so this young lady puts on the Facebook page that some guy at Walmart tried to give her a hundred dollar bill, and so she wouldn't take it and ran. And she said, "Now he chased me down. And I'm trying to give you money," and, which probably was an exaggeration. Well, somebody in the comments quickly pointed out it wasn't. We ain't trying to give you drugs. It was a gospel track, you know, because they knew the man. But uh, so, I mean, and my point is in that in this day and age with, with you know, people are, are, I don't want to speak, people are weird, you know, and people are scared uh, because of the way society is today. So we have to be careful, well, even in things like that. Not that there's anything wrong with giving out tracks. I think it's a, it's a great ministry. But, uh, you know, there's always things that we have to, uh, to, to watch out for. Um, another thing uh, is chance meetings when we just happen to be around somebody and we just for whatever reason maybe it's a, a job site meeting a uh, chance to, to talk to somebody uh, that, that just came up um, then that is an opportunity to witness All right, that's impromptu we didn't plan on it. We didn't plan on meeting the person probably. We just happened to be in the same place having a conversation with somebody. Great chance to witness. Uh, impromptu witnessing is all about the numbers, right? It's about it's about casting a wide net. It's like cold calling for a business. You might have to call 200 people before you get somebody that wants to talk about your vacuum cleaner, right? Impromptu witnessing is kind of like that. It's just spreading a wide net to, uh, to, to try to catch the few uh, interest, all right? So here's some tips that I have for that. And I'm by no means a pro in, in uh, impromptu witnessing, but here's some tips and maybe you guys can throw in some too. Number one, purpose in your heart to make this a priority. You got to think ahead that when I get a chance, I'm going to do it. I, I love Brother Lee, you hit it on the nail, uh, the nail on the head a while back when, when you, you said something like, uh, to the effect of, you know, I'm I'm just going to tell them from now on, you know, and that's the attitude that we got to have. Uh, when I get a chance, I'm going to say something and go ahead and think about that ahead of time and purpose in our heart so that when we get the opportunity, we'll see it and be ready to speak up. Tip number two, think ahead about a few ways to broach the subject. You know, what's your favorite way to enter the subject? It might change from time to time, but think of a few a few starters, you know, for instance, uh, sometimes you use, uh, do you go to church anywhere? You know, and that, well, yes or no, and then you get a chance to talk about Christ, you know. Um, here's uh, here's my favorite currently, um, and I'll, I'll give you an example of when I use this, is just, uh, do you know Jesus Christ? <laughs> it's just a simple question. I met a guy, I went and picked up a, uh, a, a kayak from a guy uh, yesterday evening. It's a nice old fella. And man, we talked for a while and stuff. And uh, when we got done, I was about to leave. And I, I said, oh, wait, Mr. Mike, do you know Jesus Christ? And he did, thankfully. And, uh, to be, and you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty easy question once you get in. Hey, you know Jesus? And, 
that gives you a chance to rose the subject. All right. Number three, think ahead, but don't worry about where to take the conversation if they want to know more. Go ahead and, you know, be blend that out in your head a little bit. Your testimony, be familiar with that. Be ready to share it because if somebody wants to know more, that's a great way to tell them about Jesus Christ. Well, this is what happened to me, you know. Uh, be familiar with the plan of salvation. There's um, another, I mean, if, you're, if you don't, get those two and you're scrambling for something to say, invite them to church. Well, hey, look, I go to church over here. Why don't you uh, come visit us one day? Uh, you know, I'll link them to, you know, I, I can't think of something to say, but, you know, here's our here's our Facebook address. You can watch, you know, some videos and, and get some information. Um, a link to social media or something. Or if nothing else, phone a friend. <laughs> you know, call somebody. Hey, look, I, I let me hook you up with my pastor and he can tell you how to, you know, he can explain this uh, salvation stuff. Whatever it takes. Like I said, don't worry about it, but think ahead about it a little bit so you'll have a, an avenue to go if you get a chance. So the, the cons, as I see it, of impromptu witnessing is that it, it's stressful if you aren't directly gifted to it or you're not used to doing it. If you're not used to impromptu witnessing, it can be very stressful, you, you know, getting used to it. But it gets easier. I said, the more you do it, the easier it gets. And, and here's a word of encouragement. Nobody has ever gotten mad at me for asking, do you know Jesus Christ? You know, I know it happens. There's rare you know, there's examples and there's people out there who might just blow their top and cuss you out for saying something about Jesus, but it's never happened to, to me. You know, nobody's ever been mad. Some people have just said, nah, I don't want to talk about it, but nobody's ever just, you know, wanted to fight over it or anything. So it's, it's really not as much to be stressful about as we make it. All right. But here's the pros. The pros of impromptu witnessing is a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of people have been saved Come to know Jesus Christ because somebody out of the blue took a minute to know about Jesus. Now they might not have got saved right then, but somebody else might have added to it a little along the line, you know. But somebody had to take that first step to tell them about Christ. And a lot of times it's not that they grew up in church, it's not that they happened to be in church, it's just somebody somewhere took a minute to say, Hey, you know about Jesus Christ. Number three, relational evangelism, right? This is something that we do with people that we're around a lot. It is a, a long-term plan to combine lifestyle evangelism and impromptu evangelism. Um, there's really uh, exposing non-believers to who we are while while feeling them out, if you will, for the best ways and times to speak about the importance of Jesus Christ. All right, you get to know them, make a good impression on them, show them, uh, excuse me, let them, let them see Christ in you. And, and over a time, then you look for examples to, uh, to speak to them about Christ. So where might we find people to relationally evangelize? Job sites, right? Yeah. What about in your family? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great place to re relationally evangelize people that are in your family that might not know Christ. Friends, co-workers, things like that that we're around. Relationally evangelize. Now, there's a danger to this. There's a danger in relational evangelism, right? Just without even me going there, does it just pop into anybody's mind what, what the danger of this might be? Let me lead you just a little bit. What we're trying to do as Christians is influence somebody who's a non-Christian towards Christianity. Now, do you see what the danger is? It's pretty easy to go from the influencer to the influenced, all right? pretty easy to let the other side influence you away from Christ. Not that you would ever lose your salvation, but rather than being a positive influence on them, if we're not careful, they can be a negative influence on us. Right? So what do we do about that? Remember the goal. Keep the goal in mind that, hey, I, I'm 
I'm doing this because I love this person and, and, and I want to see them get saved and become a part of the family of God and be just aware of that and keep that in mind so that, uh, that you don't fall into that trap. <clears throat> Pros of relational evangelism, it can be very effective, right? Um, because you know, we're working on people that you love. That's another uh, another pro of that. Not, now I know we love everybody, right? Because Christ loved everybody. We love everybody. But we'd be, we'd be silly if we said that we don't uh, feel a, a greater affection towards people that, uh, that we know and have a relationship with, family members and friends and coworkers and such as that, right? So there's, so there's a pro where we've got a, a feeling like I'm, I'm, God, I'm on a mission, for this person. I'm praying for them and I'm looking for opportunities to witness to them. All right. Cons requires a long-term commitment. Sometimes. All right. Sometimes a lifetime of commitment. But you know, chances are you're doing this with people you're around anyway. So so that's not that big of a deal. Uh, number two, it can be frustrating. Because you're trying and trying and trying, and, and sometimes you just don't see somebody responding. What's the answer to that? Same thing. Remember the goal. Stick to it. And uh, Satan will try to flip the influencer. Try to get you to be the one influenced instead of them. All right. So to wrap this up, most important thing about personal evangelism, do it. Evangelize. Most important thing. You know, I, I hesitate to ever say that God needs us to do anything because God can do anything, but he has chosen. He picked us to be the, the vessel that brings his gospel to the world. He chose the, the, the believers in him to bring the, believe the, the gospel to the next person, right? And their eternity hangs in that balance of whether we do our job or not in a very real way. So tell them. All right. One more thing uh, for, uh, for for you guys or anybody that's watching this at any time. If you need resources, uh, you know, if you need tracks, I got tracks. If you need ex uh, some example prayers of salvation, anything, whatever, don't hesitate to let us know. And, uh, and we'll get that squared away. And, uh, you know, just for anybody that might be watching by some chance that doesn't know Christ as your Savior yourself, Christ died for you and offers forgiveness free and clear we can help you with that too as well so let us know all right that's good thanks for uh for joining thanks for watching all the way through brother joe you can cut the uh the live feed right there